You know, there are some things in life, and I just don't get the point. I look at some things that go on and I just think, I don't understand why that's there. It just seems absolutely pointless. It just seems like it doesn't make sense. I heard about a convent, you know, a place where nuns live, and, and they looked after their convent, but they kept having these trespassers going right through their property who would, who would mess it up. And so they erected the following sign out the front of their convent. It read this way. Trespassing, absolutely prohibited. Violators will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Signed, the Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> and I just don't get the point. I was down at the shopping mall and I saw a sign there at a little jewellery shop and it said this, ears pierced while you wait. <laughs> now I'm thinking, is there another way to do it? Could you say, look, I don't have time to wait. Can I leave them here and come back for them later? <laughs> Ears pierced while you are. It, I just don't get the point of that. Down at Kmart, I saw a sign. It said, animals prohibited, guide dogs accepted. And I thought, who's meant to read that? We have a generation growing up who don't see a lot of point to stuff that we do. And maybe we have not educated them. Maybe we have brought up a fantastic, brilliant generation and they just don't understand that there are points to some things. Like I, I notice the most wonderful teenagers in the world who I've got to spend the last week with, a lot of them have trousers on and they put, I have a thing at the top called a belt. Now no one has ever instructed them the purpose for a belt. No one ever told them it's actually to keep your pants up, not to keep them securely halfway down. There is a point to a belt. We have not educated them. I noticed they wear shoes with shoelaces. Now, no one ever described to them that shoelaces have a point. You're meant to untie them so your shoe can come off, and then you tie it up so your shoe stays on your foot. And I see wonderful, beautiful, gorgeous teenagers and their shoelace gets tied up the first time they wear their shoe and it never gets untied after that point. And I was thinking, what's the point of having it? Because if you can't see the point in something, there's no use having it. If you don't know where the journey's going to, the journey doesn't make sense. But see, when you understand the destination, you will put up with all sorts of things to get there. When a woman is in childbirth and she knows a miracle is about to occur, a brand new human life, her child is going to be on this planet. She puts up with extraordinary pain because she knows the destination of that journey. If you've ever trained for a high level sporting activity, you've been chosen at a representative level, you know the, the hard slog that's got to go into the preparation, the training, the diet, the routine, because you know the destination, because you know what you're after, the journey makes sense. And anything that is long-term like that, that's got a goal that you need to achieve, you put up with it. You might be in a job that really is, isn't your favourite activity, but there's a result that you're after. You might be signed up for a uni course and you're thinking to yourself, is this really going to teach me anything I want to know? But there's a result that you're after and it's worth the journey. You might be going back to school this week. <laughs> you might be going back to school week next this week and you might be in subjects and you've got no idea why they're teaching you that subject. But you think there's a destination to achieve. There's a thing, there's an HSC, which is a certificate from the government which says you never have to go to school again. And I want to say that is worth getting. And when you've got the destination in mind, the journey starts to make sense. Now, wouldn't you love to know where your journey is taking you? Wouldn't you love to know some outcomes that might happen in your life? 
Wouldn't you like to know if the uni course is going to work out? Wouldn't you like to know if you're actually going to get that promotion that you're bucking for at work? Wouldn't you like to know if that girl is finally going to say yes? Wouldn't you like to know if your parents will be angry when you get home? You see, if you know the destination, you know how to take the journey. Is global warming really happening? If you knew that answer, you would know what to do with the planet. Can we make poverty history? If you knew the answer, you'd know how to deal with it. Will Parramatta ever win a premiership? Yes. Oh, one yes, OK. You see, if, if you knew that, then you'd put more heart and soul into your support for them. Because when you know the destination of a journey, the journey starts to make sense. For the Christians in the first century, they didn't understand the destination. Because how they were living as Christians didn't make sense. The Roman government was persecuting them. They were dying. They were being tortured. It looked like evil was winning. And many of them were looking at each other saying, have we signed up for the wrong deal? And John has a revelation from God which shows them the destination, that shows them where he is working towards. And as he reveals that and uh, points it out to them, that gives them hope to keep going when things get tough. We've been looking at the whole of the book of Revelation this week. It's the very last book in the Bible, and we're up to the very last chapter <laughs> of the very last book. Does it make sense? This is the destination that God has been moving to throughout the whole of the scriptures. This is the destination that God is working you towards throughout everything that happens in your life. It's a bizarre book in many ways. It's full of grotesque and unusual pictures and symbols but as we've discovered this week, it's a book that shows us that God has ultimately triumphed over evil. It's a book that shows us that Jesus has won that battle and defeated Satan. It's a book that shows us that when you join with Jesus, his victory becomes your victory. So let's have a look at the destination that God has in mind for you. Revelation chapter 22, and I want to ask a few questions because it's a picture of heaven. Question number one, what will you find in God's new creation? Here we go. Verse number one. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of his Lamb. Whatever's going on in heaven, it's coming from the throne of God and his Lamb. So it will come as no surprise to you, the first thing you find in heaven is God himself. What else is there? Well, I want to suggest to you there is life. There is life in all its fullness. There is life forever, for eternity. And there are two great pictures here that show you what this life will be like. The first one is the river. Verse 1 again. The angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. You know when you're driving in the outback and you're way out in the back of Una Whoop Whoop somewhere and you just go for miles and miles and miles and the scenery is, well, it's just miles and miles of miles and miles just that thin little dry parched scrubland because it's so dry it's so dusty nothing much is growing and then on the horizon you see a long line of shrubs and bushes and trees you know that there's got to be a creek there you know there's got to be a river because where the river flows there is life and that's the river of life which we find in God's new creation which is there for us to enjoy that our eternal life might never go away. And it comes from the throne of God. Everything in heaven, all the life in heaven is from God. If you're in a place where there is no God, then you're in a place where there is no life. That's the first symbol of life. The second one is the tree. Now look at verse 2. 
uh, down the middle of the great city, on each side of the street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. The, a tree is another symbol of life. Now, you've come across the tree of life before in the Bible. You remember back in Genesis that when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they were expelled from the garden so that they could not come back and eat from the tree of life. And God set up sentry duty for the angels and armed them with weapons to make sure that human beings could not come and eat from the tree of life. A ban was placed on sinful human beings eating from the tree of life. And if you think about it, that's a brilliant idea from God. Imagine if a sinful human being ate from the tree of life and lived forever as God's enemy. Wouldn't that be terrible? Wouldn't you hate to live forever as a sinful enemy of God? And so a ban was placed on human beings ever eating that tree of life while they had any sin on them. But here in God's new creation, the ban is lifted because God decided he would do something about our sin to remove it from us so that once again we could eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. In God's new creation, the ban is lifted, the tree of life is there, and God's promises are fulfilled. Revelation 2.7 has this promise. Revelation 2.7, To him who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. What will you find in heaven? Number one, you'll find God. Number two, you'll find life. And number three, you'll find God's servants. Verse three. Halfway through verse 3, his servants will serve him. They will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. And at the end, they will reign forever and ever. When you look at heaven, it's not just God having a great time, but every one of his servants, and if you belong to Jesus, that's you, every one of his servants is there. Can I show you four quick things that these servants will be doing? Number one, they're going to be serving God. Look at verse 3. It says there, his servants will serve him. Now, that's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to live for God. That's what it means to be in God's new creation. You might think, well, what am I going to do in heaven? You know, how am I going to occupy, like, eternity? You know, I struggle to occupy an hour of free time. What am I going to do for eternity? Your mind is going to be blown because you'll be serving God. You'll be falling down at his feet and worshipping him and praising him. And that will be the greatest thing that has ever happened to you in your life. And it never stops. Now, it started already. If you've signed up with Jesus, you've signed up to serve Jesus. Being a Christian is not about how wonderful I am. Being a Christian is about how wonderful Jesus is. And if you want to serve God like that, then you are in this picture. You are in God's new creation. First thing they're doing is serving God. The second thing they're doing is seeing God. Look at verse 4. They will see his face. Now, can you imagine coming up before God and looking at him face to face? Look at the person next to you right now. Look into their face, gaze into their eyes. Look at them. Can you imagine looking at God and seeing him next to you and staring into his glory and his majesty and his mighty and his power and his honour and his strength and it's right there in front of you? Do you realise we were prohibited from seeing God face to face? You remember Moses, he wanted to see God, he wanted to see God, and God said, no, you cannot see my face and live. But the ban is lifted when you are in God's new creation, you will see God, you will see him face to face, and nothing is going to get in the way. And the promise of God is fulfilled. Matthew 5, 8. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
You'll be serving God, you'll be seeing God, and you're bearing God's name. Second half of verse 4. It says, his name will be on their foreheads. You're going to be identified as belonging to God. Just like if you're a farmer, you brand your cattle. So you put your stamp of ownership on your cattle so that everybody knows they belong to you. You will be stamped forever. Belonging to God and no one can ever take you. You know, you buy a new car and the manufacturer puts their badge on it, puts their stamp on it, puts their insignia on it, so everybody knows that they made it. If you're wearing the aforementioned jeans with the belt positioned to keep them halfway down without falling, it's very important your underwear has a brand name across the top. <laughs> so that everyone knows what a wonderful, careful shopper you are to have selected the highest quality underwear. That brand name identifies who the creator is. And in God's new creation, you will be bearing his name that the universe will know that you belong to him. One more thing. You will be reigning forever. Look at the end of verse 5. They will reign forever and ever. That is, you get to help God run the universe. He's not off there running the universe and you're sort of sitting back, you know, doing nothing. You are there with him and you rule and you reign with him forever. That's what you'll find in God's new creation. Let's check a second question. What won't you find in God's new creation? Well, it's interesting. There's no night and there's no sun. Look at verse 5. There, there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of a sun, for the Lord God will give them light. Have you ever thought about that? The sun is only a temporary measure to give us light. When God is there, who is the light of the world, you're not going to need anything else. This shows us in God's new creation, God supplies everything. What else won't you find in God's new creation? Well, you won't find anything that's cursed. Look at verse 3. No longer... Will there be any curse? Now, we don't normally talk about things being under a curse. Oh, unless it's the New South Wales state government. But generally, it's not the sort of language we use. What does it mean there'll be nothing under a curse? Well, can I suggest there are two very important things right now that the Bible says are under God's curse. And in God's new creation, the curse is lifted. Here's the first thing that's under a curse. It's the earth itself. The earth itself is under a curse at the moment. Have you noticed it just goes haywire sometimes? Come on, you see devastating earthquakes. You see terrible things happen in this world. Nature doesn't work perfectly the way you think it should. You've ever tried to get a perfect weed-free lawn in your McMansion at Kellyville? you will understand the earth is under a curse. It just doesn't work the way it should because we sinful human beings have managed to muck it up. Does that make sense? When I sin, I don't just muck up my life, I muck up my environment. Genesis 3.17. This is what God says when Adam and Eve disobey him. Look it up later. Genesis 3.17. He says to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and that because you've eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. You see, we're not the only ones longing for Jesus to come back. The picture in the Bible is the whole of creation is calling out. The rivers are crying out, Lord, please return so these wretched humans will stop polluting me. The air is crying out, saying, God, when are you going to stop them fouling the air with their wretched factories? That every bit of creation is longing to be renewed so that the curse will be lifted, that no longer will planet Earth be mucked up because sinful human beings are in charge of it. And in God's new creation, the ban is lifted and there is a new heaven and a new Earth. 
But it's interesting, there's something else in the Bible that's described as being under a curse. Human beings. That's us. You and me. This is Galatians 3.10. Look it up later. Galatians 3.10 says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it's written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. It's simply saying, if you have refused to obey God, if there's a commandment you've decided to ignore, if there's one point in your life where you have decided not to obey what God has said, the Bible says you are under God's curse. You are under God's condemnation. When Adam and Eve disobeyed him, God said, the day you disobey me, you will die. That is, you will die in your relationship with me. And that applies to us as well. We, we cut ourselves off, off from God. We stand as his enemies. We, we do things and just simply live for ourselves. And we're not just talking about the bad people out there. We're talking about people like you and me who refuse to obey God. Now when we get to God's new creation, how can anyone with any sin on them be let in? How is it there can be nothing cursed in heaven when the Bible clearly says that we're under a curse. Well, the good news about Jesus is the curse is lifted. Galatians 3 verse 13. But Christ brought us back from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For as it is written, cursed be everyone who hangs on a tree. You see, Jesus takes our sin. Jesus takes our curse. Jesus takes our condemnation away from us. He suffers God's curse in our place. Therefore, in God's new creation, the curse is lifted. We can be there. We can enjoy God forever as his servants. We've seen just from these few verses what you will find in heaven. We've seen what you won't find in, in, in heaven. But let's check a really important question. Will you be found in God's new creation? Because there are some very big questions in the universe. Like, what happens when I die? What is the meaning of life? Will I go to heaven when I die? And here is a magnificent picture of the new creation that God has made. A wonderful world for his people. Where there will be no more tears, where there will be no more pain and no more dying where God himself will be our father and wrap his arms around us and that we will enjoy the universe forever. That is a great picture, but will you be there? Here's the answer as to who will be found in God's new creation. Jump down to verse 14. He says, Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Now, if you hadn't read the rest of the book, that wouldn't make sense. But we've gone through the rest of the book. We know what the washing of the robes mean because they're washed in the blood of the Lamb. That is, is Jesus' death which purifies us, purifies our clothing so that we can be made new. If you've given your life to Jesus, if you became a Christian yesterday on camp, if you became a Christian last week, if you signed up for Jesus 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, then you have been cleansed and you will be in God's new creation. And if you're quietly thinking, you know, I don't know I've done that. I mean, I come along, I'm here. I sort of believe, I don't know I've ever taken a definite step to say yes to Jesus. Can I show you a wonderful invitation, which is right here in the last chapter of the Bible? Verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Look, if you've come tonight 
and you're not certain you're in God's new creation. God is saying he wants you. He's not going to turn you away. Talk to the person who brought you tonight. Talk to one of the pastors or leaders here before you go home. But the invitation is there. You want in. All you've got to do is ask and surrender your life to God. That's how you can know whether you'll be in God's new creation. But let's imagine you are. Are you ready for it now? Now, I want to see if you can pick a theme here. We're in the very last part of the Bible, and I don't know, if I were God and I was writing the Bible, I'd be thinking, hmm, I wonder what I'll do in the concluding chapter. Because part of me is thinking, this has got to be the crunch point. This has got to be the thing that's left ringing in the reader's ears as he finally finishes my book. See if you can pick a theme here. We're in chapter 22. Let's look at a few verses. Firstly, verse 10. Then the angel said to John, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. There's your first clue. See if you can pick it. Verse 7. Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. Verse 12, Jesus again. See if you can pick the theme. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. I will give it to everyone according to what he has done. Verse 20, second last verse of the Bible. He who testifies, Jesus, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Did you spot it? <laughs> Are you getting a slight emphasis right at the end of the Bible as to what God wants us to know? If Jesus had to pick a little phrase just to have ringing in our head as we finally finish his book, have you picked the phrase? He is saying, Jesus says, I am coming soon. I will be back very, very soon. I will come back at any moment when Jesus comes back for every individual to give an account of their life to them, where Jesus comes back to end up human history, to fold up everything we have achieved and to bring in this brand new creation. This day when Jesus comes to bring justice to everyone and to bring everyone to justice, he says it's coming soon. Any moment, just like a thief in the night. I simply want to know, are you living like that's true? That is, as a Christian, right now, are you living in the expectation that Jesus is about to return and that you want to be ready for him? What would happen if you lived your life like Jesus died for you yesterday, like Jesus rose for you this morning, and like Jesus is returning tonight? If you knew that was going to happen, would it make a difference to the way that you would live? Now, as soon as I say, you know, what if Jesus returned tomorrow, a little thought clicks in, he's not going to return tomorrow. Come on, none of you are making plans for Jesus' return tomorrow, are you? As you look at your little diary and you've got your things in your iPhone and all the things you've got to achieve and you're thinking, wow, Australia Day is there where we celebrate all the great things that happened on that original day. Um, you're not planning for Jesus. You Come on, admit it. You do not expect him to come back tomorrow. True? You seriously don't expect him to come back tomorrow. Well, just watch out. Matthew 24, 44. Matthew 24, 44. Jesus says, you must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Does that make sense? If you don't expect him tomorrow, that's the time he actually says is highly likely he will come. He will come when you don't expect him. If you knew for certain that Jesus would come back to judge all of humanity on Tuesday, would it change what you would do tomorrow? If you knew for certain that Jesus would return for judgment uh, next week, would it change what you do this week? When you go back to school this week and you knew that in week three Jesus was returning, would it change what you did? 
And I don't mean you say, well, I wouldn't bother studying. I don't mean that change. Would it change the way you interacted with your friends? Would it change the urgency that you would warn them of what was happening? Imagine just for a moment that Jesus was going to return on Tuesday. What would you do tomorrow? Think about it. If you knew that Jesus was coming back for you to judge everybody on Tuesday, what would you do tomorrow? I have a suggestion for you. Tomorrow, do it anyway. Whatever you would do if you thought he was coming back, do it anyway because he has said, be ready for me at any time. Wouldn't it be great for us to be a Christian community where we honestly live like Jesus died for us yesterday? That Jesus rose for us this morning and that Jesus is coming back for us tomorrow. This book of Revelation shows us a magnificent God. A magnificent God who's designing a whole new creation for those who would live and serve him. We have seen a magnificent saviour in Jesus who smashes every bit of the forces of evil that a victory is won and evil is defeated. And we see in the book of Revelation that all of us who join Jesus' side, his victory becomes our victory. And if you stay with Jesus, if you stay with that commitment to be a Christian, you have God's guarantee you are on the winning side. This week, will you live that victory? This week, will you proclaim that victory? This year, will you gather together as many of your friends as possible so that stacks of people get to join in this wonderful victory. Amen.